Hello, this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. During the month of August, we are revisiting some wonderful interviews from the past 10 years of the show. This week, we explore the science behind our perceptions. But if you're craving a show you've never heard before, join us as a monthly supporter at patreon.com slash the bittersweet life podcast. There's a link in the show notes and you can hear exclusive bonus episodes for as little as $5 a month. We hope you really enjoy this conversation. Welcome to Rome. This is The Bittersweet Life with Katie Sewell and Tiffany Parks. Hello, this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. Tiffany is away this week, but I'm joined by Eric Vance. Eric is a science journalist who's written for the National Geographic, Slate, Scientific American, Nature, the New York Times, the Christian Science Monitor, and Discover, where he's a contributing editor. And he's also the author of a new book called Suggestible You, The Curious Science of Your Brain's Ability to Deceive, Transform, and Heal, and an expat living in Mexico City with his wife and son. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. You said that before we got started that you moved to Mexico City for your wife's job, but as a working journalist, do you find it easy to operate as an expat in a foreign culture as far as your work path is concerned? Or is it, I don't know, made your job difficult? as a journalist? Um, I love it. I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm a science writer. I make my bread and butter off of sort of reading research papers and trying to, you know, explain research papers to the public and and help people understand some of the, the biggest ideas that are coming out of the science community today. And not many people are doing that in Mexico, certainly not for an American audience. And so it, it offers up a lot of really interesting opportunities. I think that a lot of science journalists and and all kinds of journalists can benefit by going overseas and by experiencing other cultures and seeing the science effort in Mexico or the science effort. I know you're from Italy. You know, what's the science effort in Italy? And not just focusing on Harvard, Stanford, and Oxford, and really and really looking at the work that's going on all around the world. To say nothing of the other science stories that I've written a lot about, like ocean collapse, environmental crises that that exist around the world and those are important stories as well both of which are are science and i have an opportunity to really dig into those stories you know oftentimes we journalists will parachute into a place and try to put together a story and that's important it's a good skill to have but it's really nice to spend weeks and months sort of making sure you're talking to the right people making sure you're getting the right ideas uh, i've been writing a lot about archaeology lately and it's just because the stories are there and uh, i can take the time and, and do them right i noticed on the back cover of your, of your book even though i didn't put it in your official title that i used when we started that you have made the transition from working with dolphins or studying dolphins to being a science writer is that true <laughs> Yeah, it is. I uh, look at me a little skeptically. That's why. I <laughs> dolphins. Who studies dolphins? <laughs> yeah, not a lot of money in dolphin uh, intelligence research. Yeah, I started out my life as a dolphin. I, I studied behavior, and I was very interested in intelligence. My interests as a young person, as a young scientist, were from dolphin intelligence. I, I sort of got interested in the ocean and wildlife generally, and in intelligence. And those dual interests and the mind and those dual interests have sort of continued throughout my career. And so uh, half my stories tend to look a lot like sort of environmental stories or wildlife stories. And the other half, I'm fascinated by the mind and the the human mind, you know, and and those two interests may seem very different, but they started from the same place. Yeah, hence this book, right? This book, Suggestible You. Normally, I don't do this where I start the interview with where you start the book, but you start the book with your own personal experience of a quote-unquote miraculous healing. I figured we might as well lay that out first. Well, you say my personal experience as if I remember it. Right, <laughs> right I know. Well, we'll get to that whole fabricated memory stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, so this happened to me when I was about a year and a half old, so I'm not sure if the memory part of my brain is really even functioning. But I grew up with this story, and it was a very important story for me growing up, and, and that's that uh, I contracted a disease as a baby. It's not clear what it was. My, my parents thought it was Legionnaire's disease. I was really having a tough time. Now, my parents were raising me in Christian science, so I did not go to a doctor until I was 18 years old. We didn't go to doctors. And uh, we used faith to heal. And we used uh, our belief in God and the Bible for healing. And so 
I got this disease and it was not going well. And to say that I was passing away in front of their eyes, I've talked to doctors since then and, and it's a probably a fair statement. I was turning colors, my eyes were rolling back in my head. And my mom had a sort of a moment of panic followed by a moment of clarity, sort of a moment of peace. She had what a lot of Christian science would call a demonstration or a, a healing, uh, sort of on my behalf. And when she came back in the room, I was healed. I was fine. What happened that night, I, I don't think any of us can ever really know. And, and that wasn't the point of my book. What was interesting about that is that it created this belief, this expectation in my mind that I had access to this power, to this, you know, this ability. When I sought healing for smaller conditions, for the day-to-day -day aches and pains, for colds and flus, I drew on that. You know, I had that confidence that when I was a baby, you know, I was saved from death ripped from death's icy clutches kind of a thing. I mean, it's a very powerful narrative. And that's what underlies a lot of the work in this book. I'm not interested in, interested in the miracles that we can't explain. I'm interested in the miracles that we can, that we can trace back to our brains. And a lot of those come from confidence and expectation in the narrative that you're telling yourself. And for me, that's what it was. It was, it was that night and the power that I had and the power that God had to, to make me whatever I saw myself as being in. It was a powerful thing for a kid to have. Yeah, so in some ways, I mean, you're almost saying that because you believed it, it gave you, you could heal yourself in some ways. Is that true? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting way to look at it. Yeah, I mean, what we're talking about is talking about expectation, and expectation is belief. It's, it, but it's, um, I often say, you know, there's lots of different kinds of belief. You know, there's the belief in God. There's the belief that the Cubs should win the World Series. There's, but there's also the belief that when you drop a stone, it'll hit the ground. This is deep belief. This is very fundamental belief in how the world works. When those start to overlap, when your belief in the drug you've just taken or the prayer that you've just done becomes like that later belief, like that, that, that powerful world-defining belief, that's where the placebo effect happens. That's the world of the placebo. And some of these other things too, like hypnosis and some of these other things I bring up in the book, they happen when our belief becomes reality. Your brain can make belief into reality. And it's a very interesting sort of nexus between those two things. Expectation though, the expectations coming from your general experience in the world. So you have that story from your youth that you survived, but it would also be expectations that you get just from living every day. Is, is that true? Oh, that's a terrible way to say it, but like, uh, like with the stone hitting the ground, my whole life experience, the stone has always hit the ground if I dropped it. Exactly. I mean, you, you, that's actually a really great way to say it. You're right on it right now. Uh, the brain is a prediction machine. This isn't me saying this. This is brilliant, brilliant scientists who've, who've worked on artificial intelligence and really tried to understand what the brain is. Daniel Dennett's one of my heroes who who's said this. The brain, that's what it does all day long. And we make small predictions. You know, the ground in front of you is hard. It's always been hard. It's a good bet that when you step on it, it'll be hard again. When you drop something, it'll fall. And then there's bigger predictions, like the hunting will be good in the, the highlands next year, or it's going to rain soon. Like... The, all of these things are predictions, and, and your brain is basically taking the past and trying to make a prediction for the future. And, and that's really what your brain does. It's a prediction machine. And so what I run into and what fascinates me is what happens when those predictions are wrong. It turns out your brain doesn't like to be wrong. It, it wants to be right. It wants the world to fit exactly how it's set up. And so when, when it's off by a little bit, it will change reality in order to make its expectation fit what it sees. And it's got a lot of wiggle room. And that's really what we're seeing in a lot of these healings, these miracles, and these placebo effects, is you're seeing the brain not wanting to be wrong. Do you have a concrete example of that, a story that fits that? I do. Um, you know, I, I can say I have dozens of them. Uh, this is really at the heart of a lot of this, the, the research I did. But what, when it really came crystal clear to me was when I actually went in for an experiment. Uh, Luana Coloca was a brilliant Italian researcher who was kind enough to electrocute me for uh, half an hour or so in her laboratory. And she studies the placebo effect. And, and she basically, she, she gave me a small shock whenever I saw a green light, just sort of like a pinch, just felt like getting your, your arm pinched. And then she gave me a big shock whenever I saw a red light. And that was sort of like the big sort of foot twitching, you know, movie kind of shock where you really feel your whole body. It's not a pleasant thing getting electrical shocks. <laughs> In the movies, it looks all cool, but it's, it's actually really, really uncomfortable. Um, and so, and she went back and forth. She went back, red, 
green, red, green, until I just, that red, that red light just, oh, it was awful. I just hated seeing that red light. You're just like, oh, no. And then at the end, she, you, you could tell that the green light had sort of been, on the last round, it had been sort of turned up a little bit. Like, it, it was like a hard pinch. It wasn't uh, like it had been before. When she came back in the room, she said, you, you did a very good job um, on that last time. We gave you the big shock every time. Every time I got the big shock. I, I'm not crazy. I wasn't, you know, it's a classic placebo response, but I, it wasn't like I was trying to please them or tell them something to make them happy. Like, I really didn't feel that pain. What happened was that my brain had stepped in. I had set up this expectation that green meant low pain. And when that didn't happen, my brain stepped in and self-medicated myself, literally dropped morphine onto itself in just the right spot where I wouldn't feel that pain in order to make expectation meet reality. So it basically filled in the gap because it really expected that green light to mean low pain. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about, you know, that's a very concrete example. It's conditioning me to have an expectation and then changing it. And your brain does not want to accept that change. So it'll make up the difference. Sometimes it's the circumstance that you're in you might feel pain more acutely if you're walking across the street and you get hit by a car unexpectedly than if you were on the battlefield and you got shot. That's a story from one of the founders of this placebo science, of, the, of, this, of this work, Henry Beecher. And he's just this, this really interesting fellow who, who went to World War II as, as he was in his 30s. He was an older man for an enlistee, and he, he was a, an academic. And he was uh, working as a doctor, but he also had this, you know, this scientist curiosity because he, he was a scientist. And so he started collecting data, and he got very interested in, in these questions like you just brought up. He saw these, all these people with these huge wounds to their chest and their massive like he said, oh god one of them was uh, like an axe like wound to someone's back and, and they weren't in pain they weren't feeling any pain they were in fact one guy he has a giant wound in his back and they gave him a shot of morphine and he complained about how much the needle hurt that he gave him to and he was just like wow and so you know henry beach was that's you know, he just he became very taken with what is it that's keeping these people from feeling pain? He compared it to hospitals he'd been in back home where, where yeah, someone had been in a car accident and had very similar injuries, and yet their world had been like ripped apart, whereas the soldier's world, he was going back to his world I and mean, he's going home and as long as you know he's able to walk and he's and he, you know he's going to recover or mostly recover like he survived the war. Just that mindset clearly made a difference on how, the amount of pain they felt. And Henry Beecher got really interested in this question. And that's not truly a placebo effect. It's kind of a placebo, but it, it triggered his interest. And so he sort of followed that rabbit down the hole, and, and he spent the next couple of decades sort of really thinking about placebos. And he was the first one to write about placebos and try to measure exactly what was going on. And it was his work that really kind of led to what we now have as a placebo-controlled trial, you can't clear a drug through the FDA. There cannot, you can't have a drug on the market unless it's able to outperform a placebo. And that really came from, from him, his, his acolytes, and those early sort of observations and questions that he had. While reading this book, it got me thinking because over the weekend I had this terrible headache on Saturday as I'm popping the aspirin in my mouth. What is happening? Like I've always thought that aspirin works better for me than ibuprofen. Right, for whatever reason, maybe because I was raised with aspirin and ibuprofen doesn't do as much. But then I was thinking, is it really doing much of anything? You kind of brought into question what any of these drugs that we take do. Oops, sorry about that. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, well, I mean, let me ask you this. When you pop that pill, especially when you got a, like a strong headache, do you feel, like when you drink that water, do you feel like an immediate sense of relief? It depends on how bad the headache is. I mean, yeah, sometimes. I, I have that. I, and I actually, I actually thought that there was like a special coating that was, see, again, I was raised in Christian science. I didn't have a great background for this. And I always, there's a part of me that I always thought, well, you know, like there's the drug in the middle of it that like, you know, makes the headache go away. But on the outside, there's like some sort of like immediate uptake sort of drug that like goes into your bloodstream in your mouth and like immediately makes you feel better. Almost like, like morphine or something like that. Because when I take a pill, I immediately feel a little better. It's just sort of, oh, you know, and then I wait for the, the headache to fully go away. Now, that medicine obviously doesn't kick in for 15 or 20 minutes. Like It takes a while to get into your bloodstream and give you the pain relief. So what's happening in that initial period? Well, that's a placebo effect. The difference between aspirin and ibuprofen is 
uh, a sort of a wider discussion that we won't get into, but, but the mechanism we're talking about is pain relief. And certainly when you're talking about placebos, that mechanism is always the same. That is endogenous opioids. These are opioids that are in our brain that your brain will release when it feels like it has to in order to make reality fit. I immediately have that experience. And so I guess I'm the opposite of you. Like I actually just have, that gives me more faith in whether it's Tylenol or aspirin or any of these things, I immediately think, well, it's like magic, you know? <laughs> well, one of the things you talk about is that there is a theater to it. Like, I think the one that I probably feel the most immediate relief from is something like Pepto-Bismol or something, you know, where on the television, as you point out, it shows that beautiful pink liquid coming down and coating the stomach and being like, it's all going to be okay. Like, as soon as it enters, and that is setting up its own expectation that this is going to help you immediately. Yeah, one of the most expensive problems in pharmaceutical industry today is the placebo effect, is trying to beat the placebo effect. And, and I talk about it in the book, and I've, I've got a piece coming out in the Washington Post soon about the struggle of pharmaceutical companies to beat the placebo effect. But indigestion and, and stomach problems, irritable bowel syndrome, is on that list of very, very high placebo-responding conditions. But as soon as a drug becomes legal, you know, so it's like the biggest problem for a, a drug that hasn't become legal yet. As soon as it is legal, and then it's their biggest friend. And then pharmaceutical companies, they, they have these commercials. Like, you know, they see the pouring pink liquid or, you know, the, the, the blue, cool, pain-killing little bugs that go in and make your, you know, on, on these, you know, cartoons and things. And it really looks like it's magic. And that is about creating more expectation. And, and you see these things, they're very visual, they're very impressive. They are boosting your placebo response when you watch these commercials. So it's a huge part of, of what they do. And, and we all, we've all seen them. One of the things I loved about this book and this whole placebo section that you get into is when you think about placebos, our brain, at least in the United States, jumps to these charlatans with a covered wagon selling, you know, horse hair and saying it does whatever, you know. So you think of that sort of person who's spinning such a good story that you're like, that has to work. But you're saying that we are still spinning these stories in a sense. And one of the examples that you gave was what a doctor's office looks like. The doctor's wearing the stethoscope around their neck and they're in a robe. They look like you can be confident in them to fix you, basically. The theater is a huge part of this. The theater that, that we've come to sort of expect. These are subtle cues that tell us that we're getting better. And a lot of placebo is actually subconscious. And this has been shown again and again. You can give someone a placebo, tell them it's a placebo, have them take it, and then ask them what it was they took, and they'll say it's a placebo. And it will still work for a, a large segment of the population. Why? Well, because these things are uh, they're subconscious, and they're partly tied to all these cues you have around. My favorite one is the poster in a doctor's office that has the human body on it. You know, you got the muscles and the bones. You've seen that, right? Sure. Do you really think the doctor needs that? Like, <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Does he need to check <laughs> where the ulna is? Like, he knows where the ulna is. He's got it. Like, he doesn't, if he needs to check that thing, you really need to get a new doctor. <laughs> So what is that doing there? Well, it's, you know, it's not helping you, you know, in that you're not going to get any information from it. It's creating expectation. It's, it's telling you this guy knows what he's doing. He knows everything on this, this map and you don't have to worry about it. And, and it's just one of the many cues that we have, the white jacket and, and the stethoscope and all these things. That, and also the behavior of the doctor. All of these things work together to create an expectation of healing. Having been a Christian scientist, you know, when I started going to doctors, I didn't have that expectation. I actually thought they were going to hurt me. I have a real sort of outsider's perspective on what that's like. And when I go to the doctor today, even today, I still have this latent distrust of doctors, which is totally irrational. I can sort of see the theater. It seems very clear to me because it's not something I grew up with. And it is, and, and it is in every culture around the world. You know, I, I traveled a lot of different places, and, and everyone has their own style of theater from, you know, China to the jungles of Mexico to uh, Africa and alternative medicine therapies. Like, everyone has their own style of theater, their own cues that they use to tell you that healing is coming. That's really what underlies a lot of the stuff, and that's what underlies a lot of those subconscious suggestions that you're going to get better. Does that screw then with... People who are living in foreign countries, expats, walking into some sort of medical center and finding that there are no, none of the cues there that they are used to from wherever they're from? It certainly does for me. And you don't have to go far. There's actually some really interesting studies that almost every placebo scientist I talk to said that this needs to be investigated more, which is cultural 
the subtleties of placebo effects. And some of the limited studies that have been done suggest that uh, British people prefer uh, bitter tasting placebos and French people prefer suppositories that are placebos. And I'll just, I don't know why, I'm just giving you the, the information. You can draw your own conclusions. Please, someone in France, let us know about that. <laughs> Injections tend to work better than pills, um, and surgeries tend to work better than, than both. This is sham surgeries. It's a really great question. Like, are there certain things, you know, like people have said that injections may be more effective in Asia for whatever reason, and because these things are cultural. The difference between an injection and a pill is not nearly as large, even from a scientific perspective, as your placebo effect. So if you have a strong placebo effect to a, a pill as opposed to an, an injection, well, you're going to see that. And, you, and then colors, yellow pills work better for depression. Obviously, <laughs> you shake your head. <laughs> oh, no. Sun, of course. A lot of different work goes into this because anytime you have a colored pill, that color costs money. The cheapest way to do it is just to have it be you know, neutral colored. But companies know and, and, and you know, doctors know that coloring the pill makes a difference for how it affects us and every little bit helps and I just talked to a sports scientist who was working with a sort of fake performance enhancers he had a bunch of different colors that he got everyone went for the uh, red and white striped pill because man it was a big one like two centimeters I think and it, you know it's like man that's that's gonna do something right and they're all placebos but <laughs> then you know they and then they had black pills and no one touched them no one touched the black pill. Yeah. Wow, that's so interesting. So in studying all this placebo science, can you come to any conclusion? If we could figure out a way to harness our own brain to heal ourselves, would that be a better thing than taking medication for everything? Well, I mean, the short answer is we already do. People always tell me, like, oh, you know, should we be prescribing placebos? Well, we are. Um, 70% of doctors say they occasionally prescribe a placebo or aspirin when, you know, when it's not necessarily appropriate. And we also go to alternative medicine, you know. And, and regardless of what folks might think, I mean, homeopathy, uh, acupuncture, a lot of these alternative medicines, they don't outperform the placebo. Now, are they completely inert? We can't tell. But they don't outperform a placebo. That means that they are engaging a lot of placebo effect in how they operate. And so we use these things. And in the book, I kind of lay out some rules for how you should approach alternative medicine and, and tricking yourself. And, and there's nothing wrong with doing it. I, I do think as a society, and this is something I'll, I'll let your listeners sort of stew on, I don't know why it is, but we seem to be okay with people taking placebos, but we're not okay with people selling them. For some reason, sellers of placebos are bad, but if you take them, well, that's just human nature. Uh, I actually am the same way. I, I have little patience with people who make millions of dollars off of placebos. But for the rest of us, you know, but that, this is irrational. This is the way I am. But, uh, but for the rest of us, you know, there, you can tap into these things. And as long as you don't hurt yourself, and I, I talked about this in the book, you know, how you can avoid hurting yourself, uh, how you can avoid uh, going broke. I talked to a lot of people who spent their life savings chasing after dreams that weren't going to happen these therapies that weren't going to help them and then uh, not sending any animals extinct you know and that's if you have a placebo that involves um rhino horn or like yeah that. any endangered animal just don't 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 do that it's not the horn believe me you know it's a placebo just move on to the next one um but there, there's another element to this which is really important which is that there are also rules. You know, I talked about the chemical nature of these placebos. There are rules at play here, and this also goes for hypnosis and some of the other things I talked about in the book. Pain relief, uh, Parkinson's disease for placebo, depression, anxiety, irritable bowel syndrome, some forms of asthma, and some autoimmune diseases. All these things respond very well to placebos. And this is a world where alternative medicine can help you. If you look at cancer, if you look at Alzheimer's disease or obsessive compulsive disorder, they don't respond really well to placebos. And there's chemical reasons why that's probably the case. But for the rest of us, we need to understand which conditions are okay to experiment with and which ones really need to be left in the hands of a doctor. And I think life-threatening diseases pretty much all fall under that heading. And so it is a place where you can experiment. You know, I do it all the time. I try all kinds of stuff and see how it makes me feel. You know, if I, if I can feel better, for me, it's fizzy drinks, any kind of fizzy drink. And I, I I'm just assume it's doing something for me. <laughs> you know, and it's fine. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. But you do need to know the limitations. It's amazing potential, but there's also limitations. You're kind of also talking about the power of suggestion. 
one of the things that I love that you talk about was this woman who was in your Christian science community who was like a healing conduit that even the sound of her voice would make you feel confident that it was going to be okay, that these people kind of take on another meaning that your brain hooks onto, right? I was just thinking of this incident that I had before I decided to quit my job and move abroad to Rome. I was very torn about what to do, and my friend had never been to a psychic, and we were like, that would be a funny thing to do. Let's do that. See if we can find some answers. And uh, it was just in how the woman looked at me, and all she did was look at me and say, I think you already know what you want to do. And I burst into tears, <laughs> you know, but it was just in the, in the look. Maybe that touches back on the theater aspect of it or the sounds that you need or at the time or somebody seeing you. But can you expand? Does it make any sense what I'm talking about? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I think what that psychic and, and what a lot of the shamans that I talk to, what they really have that a lot of doctors don't is interpersonal skills, is interpersonal knowledge where they're able to look at someone and really take them in. And, and that's something that's really missing in medicine is the human element of a lot of this. A lot of doctors are really trained to, to see the human body as, as a machine. And and it's changing in some places, but overwhelmingly, I think you are a set of symptoms, you know, as a patient. It is good reasons for this. But when you go to a shaman or a fortune teller, and some of these people are very talented at reading you and, and really being empathetic to you and understanding where you're coming from. I imagine it's exhausting. I, I don't have those skills. But these are important skills to at least play with as a, as a doctor in Western medicine. We need to have more empathy. We need to have more of that skill to look at someone because you're throwing away an opportunity for healing. And, and the people who get this are pain doctors. They have such a high placebo response to all of their diseases and, and to all of the, the conditions they study. And, you know, they, they focus on these things like opioids, which are, you know, they're just such a, a rough treatment, you know, for someone who's got chronic pain, opioids, just, they have, you know, a lot of side effects and addiction and all these other things. So uh, pain doctors are desperate for new opportunities, new alternative ways to approach their disease. And they see what sort of a cold, indifferent doctor can do and what a caring, thoughtful, good doctor can do. And we know this. Like, this is not new. We, we know what a good doctor is. And I'd like to see someday in my future, you know, if someone gave me a magic wand, I'd like to see a test for every medical student to see if you can get patients to respond to a placebo pill and you have to get a certain percentage of them to respond before they let you graduate. I talked to a lot of scientists who had to work on this, and they had to change, you know, because they, in order to study it, you have to be able to do it. And they had to change the way they talk to patients and change their demeanor and think about eye contact and think about all these different things that doctors, frankly, could use. And if you made a doctor give them a placebo pill and say, okay, now you got to treat, you know, this number of people with this, I think you'd see some serious self-reflection going on. All right, well, really changing gears to end... I love this stuff that you get into about um, memory and how memories are formed. How, how are memories formed? Well, memories are formed in, in three parts, and, and your, your audience right now is going like, you know, oh my God, why are we talking about memories? This will make sense in a minute. <laughs> it's all related. <laughs> but uh, memories are formed in three parts. When the event happens and you process what you've seen, then there's when the event is sort of moved into a long-term part of the brain where it becomes a long-term memory. You know, there's a lot of things we see all day long, and only some of those things become long-term. And then there's the moment when it gets pulled out of the filing cabinet and sort of revisited when it's, you know, when, when you pull up that memory. I said filing cabinet because that's just the way I, I think of it, but it's not a filing cabinet and it's not permanent. And in any one of these moments, there can be mistakes that can be added in and changes that basically make a, a memory that feels very real, but is not. Give me an example of that. This is a fascinating field of study, and there's been a lot of work on this. One of my favorite examples, there's a woman, Elizabeth Loftus, who really pioneered this field. She got into this through actually traffic, and looking at how people would describe traffic accidents afterwards. And then she started implanting these memories into people like... Uh, oh, there was this guy who found me when I was a kid and I got lost in a mall and this guy found me and brought me back to my, my mother. And it's sort of a story that might be real. And if you reinforce it in the right way in someone's mind, they can create this memory and they can remember this thing and they'll start adding their own details. Like, oh yeah, he's wearing a big belt buckle. We're very suggestible this way. And people would criticize her for saying that she was actually uncovering real memories. That these things really happened and, and she was just uncovering the existing memories. So she decided to create a memory that... Um, 
people had gone to Disneyland and met Bugs Bunny and shook his hand. And it's the same thing. You, know, you just keep repeating these things and you have, sometimes you bring in family members to, you know, to reinforce these things. Yeah, it, Bugs Bunny. Yes, yes, yes. I remember that. And, um, well, of course, Bugs Bunny doesn't live in Disney World. Uh, he's a Warner Brothers. It's a different company. They, 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 they you know, it'd be like seeing the, the Pope in a mosque. You know, it's, it can't, it can't happen. You know, this was sort of a, a long way to show that, like, these memories are fallible. These are memories that don't, they don't necessarily exist, but people are very, very confident in these memories, and and they cause all kinds of problems for legal problems, and and uh, but they also can reinforce healing. They can also I tend to remember healings as being sort of instantaneous or being very dramatic. False memories tend to fit in with a with a certain narrative that we have, just like all of these things are based on narrative, uh, the stories we tell ourselves. Whereas the narratives that we're talking about with placebos, they relate to sort of the future and, uh, you know, something that's going to happen. If I take this pill, this will happen. Uh, false memories relate to the past and they relate to a suggestion of the way something was. And I think we all are a little subject to that. To say nothing of, you know, the, the old days were, were better than they were. I mean, these, these narratives tend to be very powerful in our lives. Yeah, it's so interesting because when I was reading that section, I was remembering that both my sisters and me all were sure at one point that as children we had visited the Grand Canyon. And my parents both said, no, we never went to the Grand Canyon. Well, either they don't remember that we went to the Grand Canyon or why do all three of us think that we went to the Grand Canyon? I don't know. I've never come to an answer for that. That's a perfect example. Uh, I... I can only think that you saw a movie. I mean, that's a great way. If you saw, if you're young enough, you see a movie. I and mean, that's the thing is, these you can be very impressionable. And uh, you know, we talked about my sort of healing as as a young child. I remember that. I have a very crystal clear memory of of that happening. Now, that's not a real memory. None of the details, first of all, are right. That wallpaper and the furniture, it's all wrong. And I can also see myself in the memory, which. Some memories can do that. They switch to a version where you can see yourself, but that, that alone should tell you that memories are very fallible. And, and the idea that you guys went to the Grand Canyon, all it would take would be one of you guys maybe seeing a movie, describing it to the others. And once you've made a memory, when you think back on that moment, you will continue to think back on the false memory. It's like photocopying something in a bad way and then, and then putting it in a filing cabinet. You, you will always pull out the wrong version and it's not like you can dig underneath it and find some other version the version you've got is going to be corrupted and that's just the way it is what benefit do we have from knowing that well uh <laughs> you know a lot of my book is very positive there's a lot of uh placebos even even the section on nocebos which are the sort of anti placebo curses and and, and that's it's kind of fun and interesting the chapter on false memories is disturbing uh, and it was disturbing for me i think it's very it's one thing to talk about your brain affecting your body and that i think we're all comfortable with when you think about your brain affecting your brain or reality or where you've been it's very unsettling and so generally speaking, I think it's something to be aware of. It's something many people refuse to believe the truth when they see it. They prefer to believe their memory. This has been documented in a bunch of crazy cases, which you can read about in the book. But there are some interesting questions being asked about how PTSD might relate, as post-traumatic stress disorder might relate to false memories. And if there's a way to tamper with memories in order to give them less impact this is early, and I don't know if it's going to go anywhere, but it, it, it would be interesting if for all the troubles that false memories give us in the world and in the legal system and in our memories of Disneyland and the Grand Canyon, if there was something good that could come from them, I, I think that would be great. In doing all this study, can you explain why when you're traveling or when you and your wife first moved to Mexico City, why your brain would be so much more heightened, like picking up noticing more it's almost like everything's seen in more color for a little while why that would be yeah i mean i i definitely had that experience your brain is it's a prediction machine you're constantly looking around trying to understand the world you're in and when you radically change the world you're in you know your brain starts paying attention to you know what's going on because that's what we want to do we want to know what's coming i mean that's essentially what we're what our brains do i've always thought that that's the relationship I know that experience and I have these these glowing memories and over time they when you come to create these expectations and you know what's coming everything becomes a little more humdrum but it's in those times I think when you are creating new memories new predictions of what how the world works 
that your brain is sort of most active because that's what it does. It's creating predictions for the future. It's like going to a new hunting ground. I mean, you know, your, your survival depends on your ability to figure out where the game is. And so if you live there your whole life, well, then you don't have that necessity. But that's a great question. And I, Yeah, would that point to some sort of difference in the personality types or the brain types? I don't know if there's brain types, but that there would be certain people who are seeking that sort of new heightened experience new places all the time and the people who really are, feel happiest when they're at home? That's a great question. The one thing I've learned from all of this is the brain is really complicated. Like I would love it. Like, you know, I love these, these movies where like you download someone's brain, like someone's like mind and like, and then you like put it into someone else. And, and I know there's people who are trying to do that and it's just not going to happen. The brain is so phenomenally complex. It's, it's this, this incredibly large, scary place to try to make any sort of and it's very hard to group brains together personality tests and chemistry and all these different things there's so many things in the way to try and figure out what drives us and there's some great research that looks at like you know can we predict if someone's a, a placebo responder you know and, and are there certain people genetically who just respond to placebos and it's a huge question and very exciting actually if it worked out but it's very hard because there's a lot of stuff in the way and there's a lot of chemistry that gets in between what you're genes tell you and the behavior you have, you know, because everything's, all the things in your brain are all working with and against each other. And so it gets to be a really messy place. And then you have your experiences to throw in the mix of it. And w among those, some false memories, it would be hard, hard to figure out that one, but I like where your head's at. Uh, which brings me to my last question is after doing so much study and writing this book, where are you at with your own brain or your own sense of what truth is in your life? We are suggestible creatures. And I was talking to another great scientist who, who works in this area, and he says, you know, we are all kind of ridiculous. We're ridiculous little creatures. We are. And, and we are. And, and this is, you know, and to, to try to pretend like somehow you have some objective truth, I've really left that behind. And it's nothing to be ashamed of if you rub a crystal over yourself and, and it makes you feel better. Like, that's nothing to be ashamed of. That's an ability that you have access to. It's a, it's a treatment that you have access to. But it's also, you can't ignore it and say, oh, that, that's just people who are gullible. This is all of us. This is who we are. It's always been who we, we are, who we've been. You know, going back through history, you look at Hippocrates, going all the way back to Imhotep, you know, this was the earliest father of medicine as we know it. They all had to contend with this. And we have always looked for ways around these things, looked for stories to help us feel better from herbs in the woods to smoke to whatever our thing is. And this is the way we are. So there's nothing to be ashamed of. And it's just, if you embrace it, you can find your own way through it. Yeah, fascinating book. And, and actually, not only f fascinating, but funny as well. So good job. <laughs> <laughs> Eric Vance is a science journalist. His new book is called Suggestible You, The Curious Science of Your Brain's Ability to Deceive, Transform, and Heal. Thanks for coming and talking to us. Thank you very much for having me. It was great to meet you. And this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. Thanks for all the ways you support us. Give us a good rating on iTunes, maybe five stars if you like the show. It will help other people discover that we exist. Thank you. You're the best. <laughs> <laughs>